Hello, I'm Lucy. And I'm Scott. We're from Book Act and this is a very overdue video about our favourite ever books. So we have been on Booktube for a little while now, haven't we? Yeah, it's flown by though. It I, I honestly, the last however many months or whatever, just merge into one super fast time flying. But and um, it came to light recently that there is an omission in our catalogue of videos, a pretty big one, because we have never actually talked about our favourite ever, ever, ever books of all time. We've probably done it drips and drops here and, there, here and there, the odd tag or whatever, we've dripped them in. I, th I think there's probably a couple that have made the top ten of the year books and stuff. But. Yeah, but a lot of mine, at least, come from the days before Booktube. Yeah. So and we it's thought potentially true of me. You could probably about 50-50, haven't you? Yeah. But we thought, you know, we should just get on and tell you, um, do a little rundown video of our favourite ever ever books. Yeah. Um so it'd be lovely to hear in the comments what your favourite ever books are. It's so um, hard though. It like, is just, so hard. Yeah. yeah. One thing we're not gonna do is just try and pick one because it no. probably depends on moods and And in fact just... Scott said to me, let's do our five top. Ever, ever, ever. And I've narrowed it down to seven. Sorry, Scott. Standard. The standard. <laughs> have you got five? Of course I've got five. He's I think. got five. Um, I'll do I'll do them quicker, it's fine. Lies. Um, but should we start? Oh, do you guess what? We've got one book. The same book as well, haven't we? Yeah. Just one. Do you know what it is? Come I, on. Do, I <laughs> obviously I do, and I also know Lucy copied me, but yeah. Well that's not true. I read it first. That's a lie. Did you That's an absolute outrageous lie. People, whoa, that is a lot. I can't remember. Um, never mind. Anyway, since I've got seven books, I'm going to start. And I'll tell you, <laughs> tell you a little bit about the books and why it's my favourite. But I think it's worth saying, actually, in a general way, um, that a lot of these books, I mean, I think, I think they're all good books, obviously, but actually, I think they say more about, like, people's favourites in general often say more about the time in your life when you read them, don't they? Yep. And I have never, bar one of the books on my list, I haven't reread any of my favourites. And that's quite deliberate because I think. I, it's the same, same actually. Maybe I wouldn't feel the same about it because I'm, you know, I've moved on, I'm a different person, and I would hate to ruin them. So, bar one, which I'll tell you when I get there, I've never reread them. But anyway. My first favourite Oh, you're book. going first, see? Yeah, because I've got seven. Uh, I get okay, a head start. Yeah, I get yeah. two first. I'm going to do two first. Um, you can't even see what this is. This is my very special copy of The Empire of the Sun by J.G. Ballard. I'll take it out of its box and show you, because look, look how beautiful it is. Now, this book is one of my absolute favouritists ever. It is um, a fictional retelling of J.G. Ballard's life as a child um, he was living in Shanghai at the time of the Second World War when um, the Japanese invaded and he was separated from his parents and he ended up um, in a prisoner of war camp a Japanese prisoner of war camp and I read this book on our honeymoon it was my romantic <laughs> honeymoon read my romantic honeymoon read so um, as you do. 10 whole years ago and <laughs> um, at a period of time when actually I had not read fiction for years and years and years. School destroyed my love of books um, and gave me a lifelong aversion to Ian McEwan. And um, for some reason, I thought on my honeymoon, our honeymoon, I, I would try a bit of ridiculously heavy war fiction. Yeah. Um, and I just went, oh, books are amazing. And historical fiction is amazing. And JG Ballard is amazing. And I immediately, started writing um, the very first bit of what eventually became The Trader of Saigon, which was my first novel. So I love this book very, very much. And for my 30th birthday, this nice boy here um, got me a limited edition signed copy of it. Um, so it's very Mug. special. This is like, <laughs> I'm not really into stuff as a general rule, but as stuff goes, she says creasing the page, um, as stuff goes, this is probably my favourite stuff. Um, so there you go, that was number one. Number two, and I'm I have to say, I, I have actually read it. And... Oh yeah, and I, for years I went on at Scott to read it because I was just so like in awe. And then you're like, it's all right, Jim's, Jim's a bit <laughs> annoying. 
Jim's a bit annoying. So which is and actually quite funny how like perceptions are, some of the stuff were fairly similar on, but I'm, yeah. for me it was a bit slow. Frankly, I questioned and I just... our marriage at that point. <laughs> um, but he bought me the book anyway for my birthday, so you yeah. know, it's not all doom and gloom. Another book that I read um, around the same time was this one, The Life of Pi by Jan Martel. Another one that Scott despised <laughs> with, actually, yeah, you just were indifferent to the oh, other that, 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 This one, yeah, yeah, yeah. you just despised DNA. with such yeah. utter visceral hate. Um, now this was a book that was given to me by um, one of my very best friends. Actually, hello Nairi, she didn't give it to me. She gave me a birthday card with five pounds in, like your nan, and said, <laughs> and said can you go buy this book please, because I was really busy. Thanks, Nairi. Um, but she was right, because I loved it. Um, basically, Pai is a young Indian boy um, who, uh, whose family own a zoo. And when his family emigrates along with the zoo, unfortunately, the ship that they are traveling on sinks, and Pai finds himself trapped in a boat with a tiger. For the next 300 pages um, and I was just in awe of how 300 pages of essentially a boy alone on a boat could be made utterly gripping in some people's eyes in my opinion um, and it, yeah it was again at the point of my, of my life when I was starting writing and I was just like how how has he done this how has he made it so gripping and also the end I'm talking really fast because I know Scott's gonna tell me to hurry up um, the end just broke my heart Oh, the end. Um, and it won the Booker. I can't remember what year. Long before I read it, it won the Booker. Um, and so go. I love that book very, very much. Do you want a turn? Should I give you a turn before I just keep going? Do you want a turn? Um, yeah. Go on then, have I, a turn. I can go, I, I, I can go. <laughs> I just forgot that you're in this video as well. Yeah, I know. But, tell, um... us, tell us one of your favorite books, Scott. So, so my, my, the first one I'll go for, just because it's actually probably like the first one I read, and it, it is semi-cliche, and it actually you can see here, from, so this is the original copy that I read, you can see it's actually a film version. So, so what I think happened for Lord of the Rings is, it was probably, I was trying to age myself now, I think I must have been like 16 or 17 when the first film came out, and instead of watching the film, I was like, actually, I should read the books. So I actually read all three books before I actually watched any of the films, and Actually, at that time in my life, I wasn't. I, I read a lot, even back then, quite a lot of non fiction, but this was the first fiction book that really I picked up. And it just took me on this adventure and this journey and just actually really got me back into actually back then reading a lot of fantasy books and a lot of like odd sea sort of adventure stories. And I, and I know it's quite a cliche book to have as one of your favourites, but um, but oh, it, yeah. at the time of my life, it, it Things still are stuck with me. For a reason, aren't they? And um, I was absolutely like distraught with the with the um the films and the way that they changed the sequencing of what happened in in the books compared to the films and the, the comparisons like i i don't like the films as a result in, in my opinion but, i don't mind them didn't like the book but i think i mean we've known each other quite a long time and teenage scott was like desperate for adventure weren't you like i mean you would just Oh, I want to be out there in the big wide world. Get me um, out of this village, yeah. Yeah, in like serious, we were serious country bumpkins. Um, and I think, you know, it it spoke to the adventurer in you, didn't it? Um, yeah. And then you nagged I needed, me to read I it needed for to years. leave the Shire and yes. find Mandu. Oh my and, goodness, yeah. we did live in the Shire. We lived in the Shire, people. Um, um, yeah. But yeah, anyway, Frodo. Um, hairy feet. Um, <laughs> okay, all right. Just... Sorry. Do you want to do another book? Shall I go? I really wish I hadn't said that. Um, Shall I go next? Yeah, because you otherwise I need I need to disperse okay. mine in between the You do. Right. Next up. Now I know I've mentioned him before, um, because I love him and I've read lots of his books. Amitav Ghosh's Sea of Poppies. This is my favourite of his books. It is the first book in the Ibis trilogy and it's set in the ooh, I'm gonna say 1830s. Um, and it's all about the opium wars between India and China and Great Britain and that part of the world and it is set primarily on the Ibis ship and is all about this enormous cast of characters who are embroiled in this um, yeah, opium war and I loved it. I loved it. It's so atmospheric. The writing was gorgeous. The cast of characters was just fantastically real and gripping. The historical setting was gripping and um, plot pace wise yeah no actually it was pretty slow but um I just I loved it all the same I loved it um 
And again, my nice husband bought me a lovely signed copy of it for a birthday. Um, so I'm very lucky. And also, um, I'll show you the others because they are part of a trilogy. You hold that beast up. Oh, so Sea of Poppies is the first one. Um, River of Smoke is the second one. And Flood of Fire is the third one. And they've all got, because they're all signed copies, they've all got these like dust jackets on that you can't get off for love nor money to keep them nice. So I'm sorry if they're just blinding you in the shining lights. Um, but I love them. They're lovely. Um, and Amitav Gosh, yeah. I mean, this was shortlisted for the book out. One of the other ones was long listed. I'm not sure which one. The Glass Palace, read that by him as well. All about Burma, loved that. Um, I don't really know what else to say about him, really. He's just really, really good. You would not like him. No, I haven't even I, 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 He's actually, that. I haven't, yeah. He's, haven't he's like tried. at the more literary end of the spectrum. He definitely is. Actually, can I just, I was about to give, I was about to give the floor back to you, but I'm just going to chip in here as well with the least literary end of the spectrum, um, which, I was <laughs> which I was debating on whether or not to put in there, um, was Bear Town by Frederick Barkman, which is the only book out of this collection, um, sorry, I really should let you go, um, that I had added to my best book since joining BookTube, and I've talked about it quite a lot on this channel, um, and it's probably, yet. Yeah, it's kind of the opposite in terms of style of writing from Sea of Poppies, but it was the first book in a really long time that I'd read that gave me that like emotional punch. So that's one there as well. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that anymore because I know. And we can link to videos and stuff. Yeah, and I, do, I have yeah. actually read Bear Town. Like, it's, really, it's pretty good. It was a, it was a close contender, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. Okay, your turn. Um, I'll go two non-fiction books now, and I have done reviews of these because I have read them probably a year and a half ago now. Um, we'll link to them below, but it, it's Grit by Angela Duckworth and Black Box Thinking by Matthew Syed. I would show you them, but I can't even remember who I've lent them to when they haven't been given back to me. Um, oh God, I can't believe it. Right, when I have, I mean generally I don't mind giving away books actually, I'm absolutely fine with that. Except for like my core of favourite books, which mm. I will not lend to anyone ever, ever, ever. Scott's just like, here you go. Oh, no, I, I, for, me, for me, the reason why I like both books, um, both are very, like, on the back of years of research, but also both explore quite, quite interesting themes around, like, black box thinking is around learning from mistakes, sort of something the aviation industry does a lot, hence the name black boxes in terms of aviation black boxes, but how that can be used in all walks of life, not necessarily just high tech or whatever. Um, so I, I found that it's like, put yourself out there, try stuff, fail, so what? Um, and the other one, Grit, is all around looking about perseverance and how to become truly successful in anything, whatever, however you define success, is, is all around sort of a combination of a little bit of talent for it. Um, a lot of it's around drive and dedication, and importantly, actually about enjoying what you do, because if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to have the drive, and you're just not going to stick at it, so that's sort of this grittiness. Um, and so I, I found it very interesting, and definitely myself, in times of my life, I've not been gritty and there's been times of life where I have been gritty and it's often quite a lot down to whether you I'm enjoying myself or not um so it's interesting I think from what you told me about the grit in particular grit is sort of about giving yourself permission to stick at the things you love and ditch the things you don't love yeah to a degree and also as well my perception is that they're sort of marketed as quite businessy type books aren't they but they're not they're actually yeah I, I, I think I think they 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 are definitely marketed business sort, but it's probably just because that's how they would sell more. But they they hundred percent would walk, like apply to everyday life, and like even Angela Duckworth is like giving examples of like her kids and music lessons or sports lessons or whatever drama lessons, and how she would let them do whatever they wanted, but they had to commit to doing it for a year and stuff like that. So they need to be into distill or like you can learn perseverance. Yeah. yeah. Te yeah. Teach them to be gritty from a young age. To drive through the hard mm -hmm. bits. Yeah, I think it so, so, yeah, it sounds like there's some great messages. So yeah, so they're the two. I would show you, but I, I can't even remember who I've learned them to. Give them away. Give them away. <laughs> Willy nilly. I don't know. Um, how many have you got left to talk about? I've got two more. But... Two more. All right, I'll do one then. Um, this is a very retro copy of In, In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. Um, now this was a second canned copy that I got a very long time ago that is scribbled all over and it is 
narrative nonfiction um, that made Truman Capote famous the world over about um, the murder of the Clutter family in like rural somewhere in America. Can't remember. That's good, isn't it? Um, but I was just captivated by this. I was. I mean, obviously, it's really grim and morbid, um, and quite gruesome and all the you know all the all that good stuff which is quite gripping it's got that added gravitas of it being real um it's got that sort of element of trying to work out what's not what's real and what's not real and it's got this brilliant context of Truman Capote sort of um researching it and blurring the lines of research and maybe possibly becoming friends or a little bit more with you know some of the men in jail and no one quite knowing what's true and I just found the whole thing completely and utterly riveting fascinating loved it it's brilliant loved it there you go, there you go. blood there you go. oh okay so up next is Billy Lynn's long time half <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk by Ben Fountain. I made a real mouthful of that. Um, so I think this may have been Book Axe days or sort of YouTube days, but right at the right very... Right at the start. Right it? at the very beginning. And I'm not even sure what direct led me to this book at all. I And I think you may find out in, in another book later on. There's, so there's sort of a military theme, sort of come from a military family and sort of within stuff. And it, this... This explores those themes, and it, I would say it's almost, I think I've described it in the past as almost like an anti-war story in terms of, there's actually very little war scenes in here. It's all around a soldier, or actually a platoon of soldiers who have been sent back for doing a good deed that got caught on camera. They're sent back to go on a parade around the US, but actually the whole book is pretty much set around them, them basically being paraded at a um, Dallas Cowboys game, and basically just following sort of, I would almost say the, the, the PTSD and whether the whole Iraq war at the time was worth it. And it really explores a lot of stuff. And I think it's really, really well done. And I think almost a testament to this book, actually at the back end, is actually like uh, a speech that the, the author actually goes to now gives, or is at least historically is given to West Point, the military academy. So so like, it's actually got such like explored in such themes and detail around sort of the value of the work that, that the armed forces do. The, yeah, I it, I thought it was really good. It um, sounds really good. And I saw the film of yeah. it, which I thought was really good as well, but you were like, the book is even better. I, I think whenever there's a book that you like, yeah. you're never going to like the film. It's never more. quite going to cut it, is it? So, yeah. So, yeah. There you go. My turn? Yeah. Right. I have got next up Strangers on a Train by Patricia Highsmith, the only book on my favourites list that I have read more than once. And in fact, I have read this again and again and again and again and again. Um, it is, well it's a classic isn't it, it's a real classic and it is exactly about what it says on the cover. Two strangers, um, complete and utter strangers, meet on a train and each agrees um, to commit a murder on behalf of the other one. Um, completely untraceable they think and they go their opposite ways and one commits the, uh, the murder and the other one is not quite sure what to do. And it is so simple, but it is so brilliantly executed. It was the first Patricia Highsmith book that I read, um, and it just sent me down a Highsmith wormhole, because um, I absolutely adore her writing, um, for two main reasons. The first being that she generally writes about real losers. <laughs> she writes about um, completely deplorable, unlikable heroes. Her main characters have just so few redeeming features and yet they are gripping. And you know, so often reviews start, including our reviews, I really liked the character or hmm. I didn't like the character, but it's just complexity, just layers and layers of fabulously executed complexity that makes her characters so great. The second reason that I love her is just her style of writing. Um, how every sentence is just packed to the gunnels with um, description that is woven so intricately into the prose that you don't even realise things are being described and it builds this just amazing atmosphere. There's a scene in here at a fairground and you think, oh, fairground, that would be nice, but she makes it so sinister. I mean, the way I, I mean, I really fair, want to read, I want no, to read no, stuff. No, it's on page like, 149. Fairgrounds are fairly sinister 149. places. 149, I even know it off the top of my head. But 
the just the way that she writes about um, the stitching hurdy gurdy of uh, of the music at the fairground and all that stuff. Oh god, I just love the way she writes. Brilliant. It's brilliant. Have you read that? I don't think so. You'd know if you had. Okay. Right. <laughs> Fell into that Wait. track, did I? <laughs> yeah. And we've only got one book left. Yes. And it's on both of our lists. It is. Do you want to give a drum roll and I'll hold it up? Matterhorn by Carmel Antes. Why is it your favourite book, Scott? I, I, it's a hard one to say why is it my right, favourite. Okay. It, it, no. It's not necessarily that my favourite. It's, yeah. it's one of so the top tell five. Them, tell them what's it about. Tell them what's it about. So it's... Um, uh, this one is a, a genuine, true Vietnam War story around... Fiction. Yeah. It is fiction, is it yes, part memoir, fiction. part fiction? Um, I can't remember the name. Melas. Melas, yep. So basically so. it's about a young a young officer who goes out and is put in charge of a platoon. And basically they're just given the most pointless task ever of just taking a hill and then retaking the hill and losing the hill and then retaking the hill. And it just follows the troop and the life of it. And, and I think actually what, what got me most is one about, again, similar to um, Billy Lynn's, the just the pointlessness of a war to a certain extent, but then also it was actually just exploring the sort of wider politics of the era, such yes. as race relations and stuff like that, which I, I probably, especially from being from the UK, what just wasn't as aware of. And obviously we're probably a bit bit too old to really know about the Vietnam War. Yeah, so, we're too young to know about it. Oh yes, too young, old. young, yes, that's, that's the word. Um, so, so yeah. I, I found it truly fascinating and really, I think it took him like 25 years to write Yeah, so Marlantes is a Vietnam War vet and this is like his life's work since, you know, it did famously take him like 20 years or something to write it. And I just, I found it so utterly devastating. I think it's got that balance in war novel of a, that's kind of rare and I mean we've you'll notice there's quite a lot of war fiction around um, and we have read quite a lot and we, it is something we like enjoy if that's the right word but for, I mean Scott comes from a military family and he could get into all like he understood the detail and the technical stuff and you know he could get into it through that way but also on the flip side it's got this you know character depth um, this enormous cast because it sort of cuts to different characters in the platoon mm. um, and you get to know each of them and they are all so rounded and so deep so you've got the, the sort of historical element which is really vivid and accurate you've got the character depth and then you have got this plot which is just so utterly ridiculously futile <laughs> and I think you know it is up there with the just the very best war literature and should be you know studied alongside All Quiet on the Western Front and Nights by Eli Weisel and, um, you know, all those other amazing war books. For me, it is, you know, it's the it's better than them. It's just the best. And I mean, we are a little bit biased because we have, well, I don't know. I mean, mm. I've one of my novels that I've written is set, uh, is sort of in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. So it's a part of the world and a part of history that, you know, I am very interested in and I've dragged Scott along with me to get interested in whether he wants to or not. That's so, you know, we are we are invested yeah. in the subject matter of this particular war. Um, but gosh, it's just, yeah. it's really good, isn't it? It's really good. And so that is our shared best novel ever. Um, I don't know how to end now because I feel like it's a bit of an anticlimax to just go, the end. I, I I would be interested to know what everyone else is. Um, I would love to. know. And also, whether like some of these books, like Life of Pi, one of your favourite all time, one of my worst. I am aware time. it's a device. So 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 I'd be interested to know in the comments like wh whose team you're on, basically, or or, or actually similar team books. Team Pi whether... or Team. Yeah. Nope. So so yeah, it'd be I'd be super interested to to to, to learn more about what everyone else's yeah. favourite books are. Um, and what you think of these, if whether you fancy any of them. That would be uh, good to know. Yeah. So, and um, there we go. It totally took us, well, a really long time to get around to it, but we've done it. Yeah. Maybe we should make it a regular thing. Well, no, because that no, wouldn't work, would it? No, because defeat the point. No, but, yeah. not at all. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. Scott's, Scott's chipping his way through the Hugos. I'm getting there. Nearly, nearly, nearly. I'm trying to get him to do it next week. Um, get that video out next week. Um, we shall see. Um, There's a lot of books. I was quite there is a lot. Yeah, I mean, you had an awful lot of books to get through. Book a week. It's the book announcement next week, isn't it? We will be reading our way through the book along list. I cannot wait 
to see what is on there given last year's curveballs. Um, and that's it. So we'll be back next week ish um, to talk to you about either the Hugos or the Booker, whichever gets there first. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you're having a lovely week. Yep. That's okay. it. Bye. Bye.